Hello, Kate. Thank Welcome. you so much for being here. <laughs> it's and, wonderful uh, to be back. <laughs> yes, I have a responsibility to ask questions on behalf of all of you. So um, I'm, um, I feel really excited to have you here today as uh, in your role as an advisor in cyber leader, you have a chance uh, to see different uh, organization, but also to elaborate more about what you have seen and what uh, you can uh, see in the future. So I, I, I would like to just uh, focus a little bit more about talent and how the talent evolve in the new work environment that has been uh, designed and presented by Rabin before. So just let me set in the scene saying that the pandemic has turned work and life upside down. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we uh, have collected uh, experience was a, a trauma. The trauma has impact and mark the attitude of uh, leader, manager, employee, vendor, and uh, you know all the people to rethink about the meaning of the world. And um, I would like just to highlight uh, the GTT, so the Global Talent Trend, I think all of you knows. Uh, there was two um, evidence that I would like to remember. The first was uh, related to the fact that uh, between uh, 20, uh, 20, 29, uh, 2029 and uh, 2022, Two, we have seen a, a, a decrease of employee um, passion and excitement at the work, about 12%. Mm -hmm. And also the other thing that has been seen is uh, we a lot of people are going uh, in uh, risk on burnout, about 80% increase, which is uh, I think is huge. People are really rethinking their priority why work, how work, mm -hmm. and uh, you know where work. So uh, based uh, on uh, your experience, uh, what uh, the organization are doing, uh, and uh, especially I think what the winner organization are doing and how they get opportunity from this uh, trauma to uh, rethinking to the future of work. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for inviting me here and a great introduction, Marco and Ornello. Um, I don't think that anyone can see the future, um, but I do think that, as you mentioned in the briefing this morning, there are many of the trends that we have seen play out this year that we talked about in the past. So in 2016, we talked about permanent flexibility, uh, the need for that to be a right as opposed to a privilege. We've talked about um, moving to a platform for talent, which you just heard Ravin very eloquently talk about leading companies move to. Um, and more recently, we've talked about the, the real race to reskill in 2020. But the big difference that we've seen from our previous trends and this one has been the rethinking about work and the work equation. Because you're absolutely right, Onella. I think everybody took this pandemic pause to think about, is this a job I want to do? And how does this job enable me to have my life around it? What we saw was the future work agenda got reset during this period. Yes, it is still about how jobs changing, how skills are changing, the need for agility, but it's equally about human-centric leadership and about health and well-being. And that's probably one of the biggest changes we've seen in employee sentiment. You know, you, you did ask me um, what are winning firms doing yes. and how are they responding to this? And what we've been seeing is those organisations that are growing faster than their competitors, those organisations that have more people who feel they're thriving, they're becoming more relatable, more human, and as you know, a relatable organization is the theme of this year's global talent trends. What do we mean by being more relatable? They're being very vocal about what that organization stands for and cares about. And they're making sure that those values show up in their benefits. They're listening to the different factions of their workforce more intently than ever before. And they're actively working together 
to build a new future of work that isn't so depleting of energy, one where people can thrive and um, achieve career success. And I think that's a real challenge we've got ahead of us. So you are saying that there is a lot of energy that we need to ensure that the people will uh, exploit uh, into the new work environment. So we are in front of, um, as we said, a great audience of HR. So what is the role of HR that, and what they may do in order to make this happen? Mm. Well, there's probably three things I would point to. Um, first off, I think HR has a wonderful opportunity to be role modeling the future of work. Um, you heard from Raven around the importance of looking at roles within the organization that maybe can be done in more new, agile ways. HR's already doing that. Many of the HR firms we partner with are looking at what are the roles within HR which could be done in a more agile environment, virtual team. They're looking at which roles, maybe a proportion of them can be kept for the next crisis and the next challenge. I think role modeling the future of work is certainly one area where we see HR excelling. Secondly, it's actually taking some of those good lessons that we learned through the pandemic and bringing them to the fore. During the pandemic, we all became very much focus on different populations, people who had children at home, people who maybe hadn't worked digitally before. That enabled us to segment our workforce and really understand it in a deep way. We need to keep those skills of segmenting, understanding the workforce, listening to that workforce, and also those skills of problem solving together with design thinking. Those are some of the skills that are gonna carry us through. I think the biggest challenge though that HR has this year is reconciling the transformation ambition of executives with employees' reality. You know, you mentioned employees are feeling exhausted. Some of them are feeling fed up this year. And so HR needs to make sure that we're really thinking about what's the ability of the organization to execute on this transformation agenda we've just been hearing about. Ponella, a couple of weeks ago, I had the opportunity to interview the head of people and performance at BMW. And he was saying, in 18 months, we introduced 22 new technologies. In their engagement survey, managers said, being a manager is more of a burden than a privilege. And so now they're looking at what should be the interaction between people and HR. And they're actually pulling back some of those processes that sit with managers so that those jobs are jobs that bring out the best in managers and don't deplete their energy. So I think that's going to be a real toughie this year. Yes, I think that all of you <laughs> recognize that uh, you have a big challenge in balancing uh, the organization transformation ambition and at the same time the employee experience, and which is an exercise which is not easy always uh, to present uh, and to define. So um, having said that, I was... Um, I would like to, to have you a question, to ask you a question around uh, um, a topic that uh, bring uh, me a strong interest. I know that in the GDT, uh, in the global talent trend, uh, what we have seen in Italy, that there is a strong focus in uh, reskilling and upskilling. If you read all the newspaper or the article, this is are the, really the key word. But at the same time, if I, what, if you look at how much um, has been spent uh, in the last year in terms of uh, um, investment in, in learning, I think has been estimated about $2,800 per learner, which is, I think is huge. And uh, um, at the same time, you see an interesting paradox uh, because uh, people said, 91% of people say that recently they have learned new skills. But then the organization say that there is a big gap uh, in terms of skills. So basically, how really cover this gap? What is your view? I see a paradox, but uh, it's, it's not easy to answer to this question, I know, but... Uh, I think you're right. I mean, um, 
I don't think the skills challenge is a learning issue. I think it's a business issue. Or actually, I even go so far as it's a, a work design or work operating uh, system challenge. Because you're correct. In the data, it says 81% of people learn a new skill this year. But at the same time, employers are saying they don't have the talent or the skills for the future of work. So we've got to reconcile these two. Um, and I think there's two things we need to keep in front of mind there. One, we need to make it easier for people to learn new skills in the flow of work. What our data shows is that many people said, I don't have the time to learn outside of work in my spare time, and I'm not seeing the return for that learning. And secondly, what people are learning needs to be tied into where the future organization goes. It's no surprise that people who feel they're thriving in their career are twice as likely to work for an organization that says, my manager has told me about what are the future skills. My manager has been honest with me about how AI and automation might change my job. If we can give people that information, it can make a huge difference. But the other thing I would say is some of our legacy HR systems don't help. They put a huge premium on qualifications, number of years in the job, past experience, and that hinders us fueling these skills-based organizations. We need to look differently about what are the non-traditional talent that possibly could do a job. And as we're hearing from Raven, we need to work harder to potentially move people around the organization. We see great advantages from using skills in hiring, using skills in talent marketplaces to move them around, and a big uptick when we start to bring skills into the reward equation. Oh, now let me give you two examples. Um, one organization who's been on this skills-based journey for the last five years is Novartis. Novartis, a uh, global pharmaceutical company based in Germany. They were very, very clear that the reason or the use case for moving to a skills-based organization is to have the type of careers that excite future talent. And Tripti Jaya, who leads uh, the employee experience there, commented to me, we have to democratize learning, build a learning culture, before we democratize opportunities, bring in a talent marketplace. And therefore, they've been very intentional about that five-year journey to move to a skills-based organization. The other end of the spectrum, we've got Klarna, who is a Sweden-based fintech. They needed to beat their competition quick, and they wanted to flow whole groups of talent to new areas of innovation. Almost overnight, they went to a skills-based organization and started to pay based on skills and capabilities with a premium for the job that you are in. Really radical. But they have said that has enabled them to get the talent they need for the future and has really accelerated their journey to skills. You asked for some practical suggestions. I think what unites both these firms is they were very clear why they are adopting a skills-based organization. They both saw it was more than just learning and they figured out what were the use cases, um, and that dictate the approach that they took. Thank you. Thank you for sharing this experience. So I would just to highlight that, uh, you know, this is not a learning problem. It's a work design issue. I think we need to think about it before to make some investment on, on the learning without having in mind what is the future of uh, our work. So, um, I have, I'm concerned about the time, but I think I have a time for some other question. Um, I think you have a, a global uh, perspective uh, about the trend and the evolution of uh, workforce. Which are the ones that, uh, from your perspective, will influence more the future? I know that is very difficult to predict the future, <laughs> but we may make some assumption and don't worry, we don't, we go back to you, it is not true. <laughs> That's fine. Look, you know, I think we have seen um, the deal that 
people are looking for change over time. As you know, before the pandemic, um, it was very much about the engagement contract where people wanted rewards and benefits. What we found coming out of this period is the Thrive contract where people want to trade pay for greater flexibility. And we've seen some really progressive companies take action there. Um, City City Bank is one which just couldn't get the talent that it needed in New York and in the UK um, to be in those high potential analyst roles. So they actually moved their hub to Malaga and they are hiring people at half the starting rate in Malaga. And the main reason that they've been able to attract talent is because they've said, you won't have to work more than eight hours. You won't have to work on the weekend. And for me, this shows that they really listened to what their talent wants and built their business model around it. And that's why I really believe that resetting for relevance, which is the first of our global talent trends, is the most critical one. I also believe that young people are going to take us to the future of work quicker than we can design that. And we see that because... We've seen, even in Italy, a 70% uptick in the amount of roles that say fully remote, a 64% uptick of people typing in remote when they're looking for a job. In global talent trends, we've seen the, the reputation of the company go from position nine to position two in why companies, why people join a company. And Ravin was talking there earlier about Standard Chartered. Um, they've done a fantastic opportunity in letting people spend four, four hours a week on any opportunity they want. But what they found is that young people are naturally gravitating towards the future areas of work, so inclusive finance and fintech. So I do believe if we empower young people to know where our business is going, understand the trends and the future jobs, they will carry us into the future of work. So resetting for relevance for me is listening to what they're saying and making sure that our organization meets that need. Two minutes for the last question. And it's about, uh, you, we mentioned that people uh, are no longer want to work for a company, they want to work with the company. And uh, I think that is very interesting, and we need to consider it. But uh, uh, this is more related to the type of social contract uh, of work, right? And uh, the social contract change. Uh, we may have, uh, you know, loyalty contract. We may have engagement contract. The thrive contract. So, do you think that these different contract can co coexist? And what could be the evolution? Absolutely. Um, we've definitely seen, we still have many companies under the engagement contract, many more now thinking about the Thrive contract that I was just talking about. But what we see from the young generation is the lifestyle contract. More than ever, we see the Gen Z population saying, I don't want to work in the same way that Gen X did. It's not because they're lazy, it's because they can see a better way of doing it. Um, and that's where I see some of those innovations with Citigroup um, in responding to what people want from the work contract, really exploring four-day work week, and being very cognizant of the energy levels and making sure that that contract fits around their lifestyle. But to deliver on that, we need managers to be much stronger in having the conversations with their people. If we look at flexible working, what people wanted a year ago is not what they wanted six months ago, and it probably won't be what they want in six months' time. So managers need to build that competence in renegotiating that contract and thinking differently about where work can be done and how work can be done. Thank you. Thank you, Kate, for, for your time. And um, I think that uh, we have a lot of uh, work to do in the future, but seem very exciting moment for, uh, for HR. So I will see, switch uh, in Italian, because uh, perché I voglio, fare, voglio farvi un appello, uh, una call to action. Uh, Mercer ha creato, uh, un, uh, ha creato il... Uh, la foresta dei talenti, come voi sapete, e con questo per contribuire a quello che è un po' il, la, il nostro impatto dal punto di vista sociale. 
Allora noi crediamo che da una parte la conoscenza sia un aspetto importante per continuare a lavorare insieme e per continuare a fornirvi sempre più evidenze di quella che è l'evoluzione. Abbiamo visto che l'evoluzione è costante e noi abbiamo bisogno in questo caso di raccogliere altre informazioni, altri dati per poter fornirvi al più presto il nuovo Global Talent Trend. Abbiamo bisogno in questo caso solo, solo di, 20, di 30 eh, nuovi questionari perché abbiamo, molti ne abbiamo già raccolti ma dobbiamo avere un numero sufficiente per poter darvi dei dati consistenti. Le prime 30 persone che compileranno il questionario solo 15 minuti ma poi avrete in ritorno molte cose. La prima cosa è l'albero, un albero che è intitolato a voi e avrete così la possibilità di contribuire e il secondo avrete la possibilità di avere il Global Talent Trend e anche una presentazione eh, eh, come dire personalizzata. Quindi vi chiedo diciamo, questo call to action, questa, questa cortesia, perché per noi è importante eh, alimentare la nostra relazione anche attraverso la, la conoscenza. Ultimo punto, se avete delle domande nel vostro barcode ricordatevi di farle perché alla fine delle sessioni avrete la abbiamo la possibilità di delle risposte. Kate e Ravin saranno anche qui durante, la nostra conversazione, durante il nostro pranzo e quindi naturalmente potete farvi delle domande direttamente. Grazie a tutti.